Welcome everyone to the 18th annual Tallgrass Film Festival. Hello, um, my name is Chris Renteria. I am a filmmaker, Tallgrass alum, and film advisory board member. I'd like to thank our sponsors and everyone else who is joining us today. Um, if you're joining us, let everyone know on Facebook and Instagram um, and ta you know, tag us at Tallgrass Film, that's at Tallgrass Film, and hashtag Tallgrass 2020. I'd like to welcome for your consideration director, Poppy Gordon. Poppy is a New York-based director. She has developed campaigns spanning across print, film, radio, new media, as well as created visuals for launch events and immersive experiences. She excels at visually driven narrative that combine bold cinematic style with pop-influenced VFX. Popsy, Poppy has directed uh, work for brands such as Nike, Wave, Nexus, Pons, Tresemme, Aaron Featherston, 350 Action, and many more. She studied in Switzerland at the European Graduate School under avant-garde film directors Chris Cross, Claire Dennis, and Catherine Brelier. Poppy, how are you today? I'm great, thank you. Thank you, thank you for sharing your film with us. Uh, it's quite a remarkable uh, piece of work. W where did you get the idea for the film? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. I'm really thrilled to be part of uh, the Tallgrass Film Festival. It's such an honor to be selected in, in such a prestigious program. Um, where did I get the idea from? I guess I just looked around me <laughs> and, and then I mirrored back what I was kind of um, seeing, you know, in my, in, my, in my environment, on social media, you know, I, as you mentioned, I, I have an advertising background, so I have to engage a lot with um, uh, corporate brands and all of that. And, um, and also my own personal struggle with wanting to be in, um, in film, with having been a female and having um, had a very difficult time trying, trying to gain entry into this medium. Um, and so while it's kind of a cultural commentary, it was also mirroring my personal struggle, um, wanting to be part of a very expensive um, medium. Excellent. Um, and so your inspirations, like you just spoke to a few of them. What did you find like the most impactful on your journey? I, I did notice you were part of a few uh, women-led film collaboratives. Did you find any of those that were helpful in this process with, with your filmmaking? Um, women-led film collaborators, you mean my education? Yes, your education and also a lot, I, I noticed you're also a part of a few groups um, of female directors uh, for advertising and things of that nature. Did that help open any doors for you? Um, no, no, I, I mean, I come from the, once I watched the series Mad Men, I understood a lot more of what was happening to me and, and and um, why there was kind of a glass ceiling and why, um, uh, you know, gates of entry um, were more difficult. I think society had a hard time. Um, they saw directing as something that was bound to authority um, that had to carry a certain weight and a certain amount of gravitas. And when you're five foot three and you're um, not threatening looking at all, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to have people take away the same sensibility. And I think that directing and authority and what authority needed to look like was very cemented in people's minds. And so whenever it came down to those types of positions of leadership, um, we all, you know, we also saw that in corporate positions, they were just going to men, even if it was a man of a smaller stature, it was still going to a man over, over a, a lady or, um, and, and so, um, I think what made that ultimately, I'm not, I, I, I'm not sure why all of a sudden you really saw that, um, change. I mean, of course, um, the European filmmakers that I studied under, Claire Denis and Catherine Brea, um, and uh, Chris Cross, who's, who's uh, United States based, but she, Chris Cross had a really hard time in America. And only recently um, with her book, I Love Dick, um, and that being turned into a uh, Amazon series, um, did, did she kind of get some of the credit that she should have been getting for a long time. In Europe, because film is funded by um, film funds, 
certain female filmmakers were having more of an opportunity um, at it, even though they were not um, male. Mm -hmm. um, but here we weren't seeing that. I, I was on the producer side and whenever I was looking for a director for a commercial, the only ones that I could find was Alice McLean, who I love, I'm a huge fan of, and uh, Floria Segismondi, and that was it. And other than that, there, there was really nobody to choose from that was a, a, a female. But um, I think, um, you know, lover or hater, uh, Lita Dunham created a lot of hype because she was young, because she didn't conform to any kind of, um, you know, expectations. And uh, her show, ha you know, the fact that um, it was kind of self-created all from tiny furniture and their own experience uh, brought a lot of attention to just female capability. And then um, I'm not sure at some point our industry got uh, shamed into it. You know, I, and I certainly think that pressure from female groups such as um, uh, Free the Work, which used to be Free the Bid, has helped um, shed light that this is a problem, but the problem is, is is just because these organizations exist, it's it hasn't really changed that much. It's more like we've raised the issue and now we don't get called hysterical and um, cute and funny for bringing mm -hmm. up weird things that other people aren't comfortable with. But um, but the the opportunities still just go to a few token filmmakers who have the top name recognition so that brands, um, you know, film companies, everybody can say that they are not um, gender bias or race bias or uh, sexual orientation bias. It's going to certain token voices, um, you know, that um, have been selected by skill or by uh, moment in time. But the opportunities have not trickled down or spread. Beyond, as much beyond the, the 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 token voices that have been upheld for the certain cause, so we still have a long ways to go to get um, our film industry to take risks and more actively um, develop talent um, based on talent and not based on just check boxes. Mm. Very good point. Very good point. And so is, could you say that's kind of what inspired you to make this particular film? Uh, aside from just wanting to also like, you know, you have a passion for film and you wanted to do your own film to get in, into this part of the game more specifically. But tell me more about that inspiration, because like everything you just hit on is like, I see it every day. Like, it's very true. Like, even uh, if it's a BIPOC uh, director or, or a woman director, like you see g and &E come in and you know, like 95% are, are white men, you know? And so there's a lot of other positions, I think also on the film set um, that also are affected by this. And so, you know, were, were there, uh, what were your greatest challenges like keeping that in mind uh, while making this film and how did you overcome some of those? Um, well, I mean, stories come from all sorts of places and audiences come from all sorts of places. So I just think it's a given that diversity should be naturally occurring on in front of the camera, behind the camera. I, I think it's actually the natural course of things. Mm -hmm. I think what's happened is that we have, you know, um, institutionalized forms of prejudice that have kind of corrupted and perverted what would be otherwise a very natural process. Um, so the, in, the this type of institutionalized um, uh, prejudice um, is within our is obviously within our history, and it's things that we're still kind of contending and and battling with. But history has to do with um, gatekeepers and those that pass on a baton. And when you have gatekeepers um, that are largely from the same class, 
um, that have gone through the same institutions, that have gone through the same preschools, um, since you know we already have this type of um, you know segregational system that is occurring almost pre-birth um, that gets passed on the social stratification um, that we have in the states under the guise of democracy and free capitalism, it tends to be a buddy system. So opportunities and um, valid voices, all that gets passed down by, oh, this is, this is, you know, this person's tends to get more opportunities based on, you know, other people around them with upward mobility. This is kind of like a known fact. Mm -hmm. And it's no different um, in culture. So what my film was lar largely touching on is how are we really going to change our culture if we're, if we're, we're not keeping class in mind when it comes to the cultural gatekeepers. Um, and, and that's how you end up with things like Green Book or American Dirt or, you know, any of these other things that we're, that we're kind of uh, talking about where you have a bunch of people, you know, patting each other on the back and talking about how everybody's helping one another and, you know, highlighting um, important uh, social justice stories. And meanwhile, they get their portrait taken for Vanity Fair and the article's all about them. Um, that's what happens. And so that's kind of what I was trying to um, uh, point out, that if we're really trying to make a change and we're trying to open things up, then um, we also need to talk about um, how we select what voices get seen and heard. And it's a double-edged sword because I know like, for example, right now the Oscars have come back and they've come back with the big, you know, checkered, checkered list. And I know film festivals really want to change and create opportunities and, and that's really wonderful. Right. And, and they've also created this kind of, you know, system before you even apply, you have to say, you know, who you want to sleep with and, you know, what your, um, what your, ethnicity is and how you identify and all this stuff and it's a double-edged sword because while I'm grateful that folks are wanting to make these types of changes there's also something extremely um I don't know it 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 feels a little bit um it feels a little bit like you're undressing me before you've even seen my film mm. like can you look at my work? Because that's really what I'm asking for is equal opportunity for you to look at my work. I don't necessarily want to be selected based on my gender, you know, nor do I know that other people want to be selected based on something that they're not putting forward to be selected by, you know? Yeah. So, and then when, when these institutions, instead of touting, hey, we have this great film, instead they tout their percentages of diversity, in their PR release, it's also questioning who are you helping or who are you using? Mm -hmm. And how are we not furthering the same type of exploitation that was going on before? You know, I think the young actor um, in Star Wars uh, was mentioning something similar, that he was being, um, do you know his name? I'm forgetting it right now for some reason. Yeah, as uh, John uh, Briellas, I think is how you say his last name, yeah. Um, I think he, that's the one you're talking about. Uh, he was the African American actor, mm -hmm. British, um, I believe, that he was given a, a pretty marginalized part with a marginalized storyline, but that they were marketing the hell out of his 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 presence. Mm -hmm. And again, it was like, who are you trying to benefit? Are you trying to benefit the the actor, the people watching the film, the storyline, or you, or is this part of a marketing initiative, you know, that you've been kind of shamed into, um, so that you don't come across as uh, racist, um, you know, so things are double-edged sword, and there's like a different, people are trying to, institutions, people, everybody's trying to navigate this time of change right now, and I also don't think it needs to be 
that everybody needs to slam each other, you know, during this time of confusion and change because people will make mistakes and people need to be able to learn and evolve. Um, and it's kind of creating an open dialogue. And that's part of what the film was about was taking issues that are uncomfortable and, um, you know, swept under the table or that we just hide under political correctness or fascist behavior and kind of just putting it all on the table and saying, well, why don't we just get into the nitty gritty and the gray, the gray area of this and let's talk about this, you know? Absolutely. And in trying to communicate that feeling, um, like what, what were, like what were some of the hardest things to overcome? Like, obviously it's a, like it is a double edged sword, but there's also a fine line. I mean, you are also wanting to you know, get your film into festivals and to be seen to communicate your idea and the feeling of the story. Like it's, how how tricky was that to work through all of that? Is it John Boyega was his name? Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Just making sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, the film is a double-edged sword and it is a fine line. And I'm. I, it was very interesting to me to see which festivals let this film in and which ones turned it down. Because it also says a lot about um, the you know, orientation of the festival and what they find amusing. I think the film is really hit and miss with people. I think some people really like the film and they're like, oh my God, this is, wow, this, how did you pack all this in in 13 minutes? This is really great. And other people are just like, I didn't get it. I, I have no idea what you were trying to do. Totally boring. Um, don't get it. Are you really leftist? I don't know, like, <laughs> I don't know, you know, are you right wing? I don't know, like, I, I, I think it's a, it, it, some people have a hard time placing it, you know, or for some people maybe it just didn't fit into their program, but the film is called um, For Your Consideration because it was also addressing the programmers um, mm -hmm. personally and, and saying, will you consider this piece? Can, can, you know, can we get your consideration? It's also obviously a nod to the Oscars and, how they make their decisions. Um, and we were under no, you know, conf we were not confused that we we're not going to be getting an Oscar for this movie. <laughs> we were also um, kind of half expecting not to get into any festivals because we knew that it was uh, kind of an edgier film to make that questioned the selection process of film festivals themselves and that it could easily be taken as an insult, um, which wasn't the intention, but it could be seen as such. So yes, I did want to be a filmmaker and I did want to get into film festivals. Um, and it is a double-edged sword in, in that. Um, and thus it's also very tongue in cheek. It's, it's dark humor. Um, yeah. It's a little bit curb your enthusiasm in that way where it makes fun of our moment in time. It makes fun of myself. Mm -hmm. um, it kind of doesn't take any hostages in terms of, you know, how it talks about our, our, our human um, behavior and Achilles heels. <laughs> exactly. And it was, I thought it was remarkably done. I mean, even the set design and costumes and everything, but, but specifically, I think the casting was remarkable and, uh, and, and, and the cast was just, they were just, every single one of them just kind of shined in their own way. How was it? Um, to, how was it to cast this film? And can you tell me a little bit about the cast and maybe their feeling about your passion and, and doing this project and, and your feeling about a lot of these things? It seems like it seemed like I had a feeling of a very tight crew on set. Like everybody was very much in the pocket together, like with this story. Yeah, I think that was a really um, strong sign that we had something here. You know, I had, um, you know we'll talk about this later, I know, uh, but I had saved up the money to, you know, make a film and I was very torn over what to make. And I'd always have an idea and I'd be like, oh no, it's not good enough to waste all my savings on, you know, oh, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. So I had, I was a little gun shy. And then I had uh, this idea that was like, well, this could really burn me as a filmmaker before I even have a start and get me blacklisted at every single film festival um, before anybody knows me. Um, this seems like a really good idea um, because there was a personal challenge involved and I was like, can I get my message across and walk that fine line, you know, without, um, without getting totally burnt in the process. And a lot of my close friends that are also in the film industry 
were very concerned when I said I wanted to make this film. And they said, maybe don't make this film. I, I, I uh. kind of don't think you should make this film. And there's really nobody that said make this film. Um, in fact, even my mother and my grandmother were completely <laughs> against it. <laughs> so, and all well, of- You charged on, charged yeah. on, yeah. And all of my, um, you know, producers that I work with a lot, they were also kind of like, yeah, I don't want to put my name to this one. Um, I have good relationships with the film festivals, you know, I don't want to, you know, put myself, I don't want them to get confused, think I'm attacking them, and yet, you know, um, all of that. Um, but we sent it out to casting uh, directors, and we sent it out to actors, and the response was off the charts good. Mm the level of talent, the actors that were ready to audition and wait around the corner for this film was amazing. And that was really the first sign that I had personally, like, maybe it's good. Maybe it's good that I move forward because this film is gonna live or die by the talent. If the talent doesn't act this out right, if they don't deliver the lines correctly, I will have crossed that line and I will just have pissed everybody off. Um, and I was very lucky that Samantha Robinson, who um, has quite the reputation already as a star, um, having been in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, The Love Witch, um, you know, she read the script and was just like immediately got it and was like, I'm in let's do this, um, which was a huge vote of confidence. And um, Juliet um, uh, and Ava and Tess, um, you know, all of my, my actors were um, really understanding of the humor. Um, Jasmine Karina, everybody was understanding of the, the humor and the satire and the wit of this film and they completely got it. And they were also more my audience. Mm -hmm. My grandmother and my mother were not my audience as much, you know? Right. And they really got it, and they um, really wanted to be a part of it. And uh, we could tell when we did kind of like the table read, just the chemistry. And then, of course, like you said, my whole kind of crew uh, were, were very kind of tight-knit. And, um, and the producer, Lisette, um, who was working on this, she's also a little bit younger. Mm -hmm. She's not young, but she's younger than me. And she totally got it as well. And was like, this is great. Let's do this. So, so it was interesting to see kind of the difference in generation and how different generations were responding to it. And that really gave me the indication that um, we should forge forward. And then when I was on set, we had a very relaxed, wonderful atmosphere that was really about playing and, um, and joy and, um, and, and creating kind of, quote unquote, a safe space. Um, for, for kind of experimentation to, to happen. And um, also during the filming, I kind of knew, okay, this is going to be good just because the vibe was so good. Yeah. And we were having a lot of fun making it. That's awesome. That's awesome to hear. So any unexpected things happen like on the set or while making the film that, uh, that you like to share, like anything out of the ordinary? Um... You know, we started filming, I, I would say, no, nothing really out of the ordinary happened, but we were already filming. We did not yet have a prison and nor did we have a horse. <laughs> so right. let's just say that, that what was kind of, um, you know, fun and unexpected was scouting prisons while filming, um, finding a prison having to find my actor, having to fly him out from a different state, having to secure a horse, having to get, you know, um, Skylar Maxson, who's also a notable actor in his own right, you know, dealing with, um, um, you know, it is, a, it is a short, and he was a really good sport about getting on a horse. I mean, there are certain risks that go, that go on about getting on a horse, so, right, and, using, yeah. and using his own name as part of the character for it, so, um, so no, I wouldn't say anything really unexpected happened, but it was one of those where, you know, we had what we had and then we had to figure out how to get the next step, um, while we already were filming and the shoot days were concurrently. So we had three and a oh, half yeah. shoot days. We were looking for the prison, like, like on a shoot day. <laughs> wow. 
Yeah, that's pretty. That's a pretty intense schedule. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, because it's like it is like it is extremely well lit. It's polished. Like all of those things that typically push you back and they have you extra days. It was incredibly done. Um, so speaking of like a lot of those details, can we talk a little bit about like maybe like how you funded the picture and um, and like what that looked like? Because it, I mean, it really looked like like no stone was left unturned. It just was really really packaged well together from from beginning to end well you know what's kind of funny is that um i mean i'm still learning this is the first film that i'm putting into festivals and um i've been very um surprised that we've gotten into 17 festivals that was mm -hmm. never expected and um a lot of them oscar qualifying and really good ones um so i'm very grateful that this is happening. And also, we wrote the film two years ago, made it a year and a half ago. I'm not sure if currently the current climate had something to do with perhaps programmers being like, yeah, we're more open to this mm. than maybe they would have been if it was submitted two years ago. I'm not sure. Right. Um, right. But either way, I'm really uh, fortunate that this film is finding its audience and that I'm getting some kind of a dialogue, you know, going with, right. with, with the audience members about, cause that's kind of your biggest compliment is being able to connect with audiences and, and have a thought exchange like I'm having with you. Um, right. and so, yeah, I ended up working very hard, um, and saving my own money and putting my own money on the line for this film, figuring, well, I'm not going to ask other people to possibly jump off a cliff with me for, you know, something that's quite untested in a very risky film. Um, but I might ask them for my second film. So <laughs> <but> <laughs> for the first one, I'm going to, I'm going to self fund it. So um, I wanted to make the film for 10 to 15,000 if you look at plus festival submissions and all of that, it's probably more closer to $50,000 that was put into the film, which was very painful. Um, <laughs> definitely hurt. Um, you know, I was very lucky because I have close relationships with uh, my DP, my editor, my, you know, producer, art department, production design, like all of that's my keys. And so we were all kind of in it. So it's not like I was really paying everybody their rate, but right, right. Um, it is still a three and a half day shoot. And then um, I had to put myself up in LA for a month, you know, which is not where I live and, and all of that. So um, the film did kind of end up costing a pretty penny. Um, and it, it probably, to be honest, if I can congratulate myself a little bit, I think it probably commercially speaking looks more than 50,000, let's say, let's say my, you know, just the, the film cost maybe 35 to 45. Um, I, I think commercially speaking, it looks more like a $250,000 film. Yeah, I, I I agree with you. Like that was the first thing that uh, that caught my eye when I first when I went by it the first time was, like the production value on it looks amazing. I mean, and especially with like Samantha's performance and everybody else, like it's like the timing is per like it's just spot on. Like it just looks really really well done. So it looks and I, expensive. <laughs> it does, and I think what is like there's um, like there's been a couple quotes, but like, people say you have like this bold cinematic style, like pop influence. Like that's kind of like your commercial work and I see it carried over like in you know even in her the costumes and the colors and all of these things like like it just you know you're incredibly talented and I was just very very impressed with what you did and um you know really curious too like what is your proudest moment of the film like what makes you most proud of like this project and like where you are now with it um to, to be Kamala Harris and backtrack one second since I saw the debate. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. It's fresh. It's time. There's Go ahead. <laughs> one, there's one more point that I wanted to make. Once I started to submit it, I realized that a lot of film festivals actually prefer it. And correct me if I'm wrong, because I think you might know more. They prefer it if your film looks as low budget as possible. Like, they like to about see... They like to see that you've done a lot with very little. Okay. If, if you can show that you've done a lot with very little, that's very indie and that's very cool. Right. And my film, even though I did a lot with very little, it looks like I just did a lot with a lot. 
<laughs> and so I was be I was being told, oh, it looks too commercial for some of the most hardcore, you know, in the festivals, it looks too commercial. It looks too huh. expensive. Right. Um, and for somebody, you know, that doesn't come from money who self-funded it, it was a little bit like, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> well, why did I get the memo? Why right, did somebody right. tell me, you know? But I mean, the film does even kind of mention, um, you know, oh, we could shoot this on an iPhone and get in like, you know, like these, right. kind of the, 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 the gimmicks of like what we like these days, but uh, as much as I mean, it, you know, like as much as people uh, won't want to admit it, I mean, it kind of is like this way of holding up a mirror and just kind of everybody, like a self-deprecating kind of moment of like just like you know, I think a lot of times we take ourselves, especially today in these times, like a lot of people take ourselves very seriously. Like I mean, things are very dire and they're very serious, but um, you know, I thought it was a, it was definitely a breath of fresh air uh, to kind of take a look at kind of the perspective of like what is happening constantly around us in our bubbles and I thought it was interesting also that you picked LA uh because it was you know had that same polish and uh I've seen some of those things so I mean you're not too far off you know I kind of called it a candy coated Trojan horse because <laughs> while yeah. I'm trying to talk about some very uncomfortable subject matter um, I did it in a way that I thought would attract the broadest audience possible, not repel anybody and not make things seem um, so un so scary. So I see it a little bit like a dark musical, like a cabaret mm -hmm. of sorts, kind of like the Umbrellas of Cherbourg meets cabaret, you know? Right. It talks about some really dark, difficult subject matter, but it's all, you know, in pastels um, and, and everybody's, you know, quote unquote, singing and dancing their way. Um, into it so that's that informed some of the color palette um in, in a sense as i wanted to feed it feed it in the same um uh, you know uh medicine you know what was a you know what's very pop and say um something the makes a go down. full of sugar makes spoonful the medicine go down that's it yeah <laughs> exactly. i would say this is definitely that it's a spoonful of sugar that makes the medicine go down and that was part of the idea of it so yeah um, that's why it was so important to me that it looked really good and you asked me to kind of, uh, you know, put a bow on it, what I'm most proud of about the film. I would say that I, um, you know, that I kind of took uh, a subject matter that maybe I did know isn't for everybody and is more of a difficult uh, film, more in the line of a Todd Solondz of sorts. You know, not everybody loved happiness. I loved it, um, you know. And that I um, that I overcame my own fear in doing it, and that I made it, and that I, in the end it kind of came across the way that I always imagined it. Terrific! And for everybody that's going to watch the film, like definitely stick around through the title credits for obvious reasons to celebrate everybody that made the film. But also, there's some great outtakes and uh, some some scenes at the end uh, that are bonus. And uh, but they were they kind of like talked about putting a bow on it, literally like. It was perfect, definitely. So for Poppy Gordon, uh, what's next? This is the first one uh, out of the can. Like it's, you know, it's got legs, it's moving. What's what's next for you? Um, well, I had no idea that a, that um, dealing with film festivals was going to be a full-time <laughs> job. So this oh, yeah. whole pandemic year um, right now that we're, that we're in um, with all these online festivals, they're so time consuming. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to, um, work on a feature right now, to, uh, the writing process with my co-writer Aldo, um, same writer that we just worked with. Um, I'm working on a feature script right now, and I'm hoping that I can kind of figure out the short version and be shooting that by next summer. And then I can actually kind of be, um, you know, hoping to get some, support for the larger feature behind it um so that's something and then you know i'm also just uh, developing other ideas as i as i as i go see what kind of takes off um all between um, the film festivals and everything that goes along with it so hopefully i'll get something on the books that's fantastic well we certainly appreciate your time coming in today for a q a 
Um, and for the audience, I hope you enjoy the film and the Q&A. And again, if you're enjoying yourself uh, this year at the festival, uh, make sure you let everybody know at Tallgrass Film and hashtag Tallgrass 2020. And uh, everybody have a great festival. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you again, Poppy. I really appreciate it. Thank you.